microphone's right here. Good morning and welcome to the service of worship, our communion service on the first Sunday in May. Just before we begin, there's a few announcements that I'd like to make. Um, thank you to those, again, who are using the options for donating uh, to us, to Knox Church, uh, who ca when you cannot be here in person. Uh, we have received, I think, donations through post and on the website, which is now working and also uh, through uh, email uh, by sending it to donate at knoxcalgary.ca. After the service, we're going to try something different. We're going to host a Zoom coffee hour, and the link should have been sent to you along with the service telling you how to log on to it. So at about 11.45, if you Zoom in, uh, you'll find other people from Knox, we hope, uh, and uh, be able to catch up with some, some friends. Also on Thursdays at 10 a.m., uh, we uh, have been successful for the last two weeks at hosting a virtual coffee hour uh, for the cafe, and you're welcome to join as well. You can contact Wynn or Tiffany uh, to get the details on the Zoom uh, um, link. That, I think, are all the announcements for today. For our centering prayer this morning, there are two lines that I'd like us to join in together, and they're very simple. The first one is Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the gate. 
Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the gate. The second one is Jesus is the good shepherd. 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 Please join me in the call to worship. Guard your steps when you go into the house of the Lord. The draw near to listen is better than the sacrifice offered by fools. The Lord will hear the desire of the meek. The Lord will strengthen their hearts and incline his ear to do justice. Rise up, O Lord. Lift up your hand. Do not forget the orphan or the oppressed. The Lord is King forever and ever. Please join us in the singing of this hymn, You Lord are both Lamb and Shepherd. Let us pray. Holy Lord, you are the God of the living, not the dead. For you, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, spoke from the burning bush about our ancestors and spoke of them as living with you. Truly, you are the God of the resurrection. Yours is the power revealed in your word by which the dead are raised to new life and Christ Jesus your son is the head of your new creation by your grace you have given us the spirit of your risen son to dwell in our hearts that we might die to sin and self and live together with Christ come Lord and receive our humble yet exultant testimony to your goodness 
Hear us now as we pray the words of confession together. O God, holy and merciful, we confess that we often speak before we think, giving voice to pride, skepticism, and words with knowledge. Forgive us, Lord. Do not be angry at our words. Search our hearts and guide us into purity of thought, word, and deed. Let Christ Jesus reign in each heart in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the sure promise of the resurrection. Amen. celebration of what humanity can be is here. We are invited to celebrate the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus. 
to remember the life offered to us in Jesus. While the world may desire us to think that violence and selfishness are the only way, God sent Jesus to show us another way, a way of peace, of obedience to God's will, a way of love. Let us commemorate this day of celebration in joy. Come, gather, remember, fill your senses with the gifts of God. See, hear, smell, taste, and touch what has been prepared for you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus assembled with his friends, disciples whom he chose to minister with him. He took the food that was prepared for them, bread and wine, and after giving thanks, he shared them with his friends. He reminded them of their relationship to God and their responsibility to one another. Let us take these and do the same. Please join in with Psalm 10. They stoop, they crouch, and the helpless fall by their might. They think in their heart, God has forgotten. God's face is hidden. God will never see it. Those who trust in the Lord stand fast forever. Rise up, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the oppressed. Why do the wicked renounce God and say in their hearts, You will not call us to account? But you do see, indeed you know trouble and grief, that you may take it into your hands. The helpless commit themselves to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoers. Seek out their wickedness until you find none. The Lord is sovereign forever and ever. The nations shall perish from God's land. Those who trust in the Lord stand fast forever. O Lord, you will hear the desire of the meek. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice. 
justice for the orphan and the oppressed, so that those from earth may strike terror no more. Those who trust in the Lord stand fast forever. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, reading in chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. Very truly I tell you, Anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls for his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. The word of the Lord. Now, if you're following along, in your own Bibles at home, and not just in the text that we've sent you, you'll notice that there was a verse missing in verse 7. That was not intentional. I didn't have it with me for some reason. So the important verse that's missing says something like that they heard these figures of speech used by Jesus, and they didn't understand them. And that's an important verse for this story. So if you haven't got it in front of you, Remember that one. It'll come back in a few minutes. We have seen in John, John writes in using many figures of speech. He doesn't just settle for stories, light stories, of how things happened in Jesus' life. He uses all kinds of different metaphors. In the first three Gospels, we see Jesus using a lot of stories. There, they're called parables. And it's thought that Jesus used this method to teach people. But in John, John abandons a lot of the language and some of the important theological words that are contained in those first three Gospels. And in John, Jesus never tells a parable. There are many ideas that John doesn't use from those Gospels. What John does use, and what he calls these figures of speech and uses figurative language, is this Greek word called paromia, which we know in other translations as proverb or maxim. These figures of speech are a lot shorter. They're sometimes only one-liners. They can be simpler, but they can be much more difficult to understand because if they're not used in the right context, or if they're translated to another context, we have no idea what they mean. Whether we're internal to the story, as we see the confusion of people in terms of what Jesus is saying as John is telling it, or as readers who see these proverbs and maxims used and wonder where they came from, and we wonder what they really mean. But this is where I'll set you up to remember and to encourage you to remember John's purpose. For if we remember John's purpose, some working out of these figures of speech is a little bit easier. At the end of chapter 9, if you go back a few verses before the one that started, we started with today, in that chapter, Jesus heals a blind man. The blind man sees. And while many find this as a source of great joy, 
Some find this to be very controversial. How dare Jesus heal on the Sabbath? And at the end of that chapter, Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Such seems to be the effect of Proverbs, Maxims, and Paraomia that seem to be illuminating to some, but very confusing to others. Some commentators have suggested that the verses we read, read this morning are some of the most difficult to understand and interpret in John. Looking at these ten verses, we seem to have two distinct parts, verses 1 to 6 and verses 7 to 10. The first part introduces the image of a shepherd, a gatekeeper, a thief, a stranger, sheep, and a sheepfold. Verse 6 concludes that they did not understand what he was saying to them. Now, instead of trying to harmonize these ideas, I think that we need to see these as separate sayings that have been here combined as an introduction Uh, to what uh, two two I am sayings that John uses in this passage. One in verse 5, I think it is, and the other in verse 11, which we did not read. There is, I think, two different parts to this this section, two different uh, proverbs. And we see this because of the difference in language and the difference in direction of what is happening as uh, John introduces them. So the first one, there is a contrast between the shepherd and thieves and bandits. And we're told that the direction of the shepherd is coming into the fold, and the shepherd comes in through the gate. But the thieves and bandits come in by other means. In the second uh, proverb, we see a contrast between the gatekeeper and a stranger. But here the direction is not coming in, the direction is going out. The gatekeeper opens the gate and the shepherd leaves first and calls the sheep out and leads them to a fertile pasture. It continues that the sheep do not follow a stranger because they do not know the name, the the voice of a stranger. And more likely, they would be scattered if a stranger tried to call the sheep. These differences of direction, coming in and going out, of shepherd, of gatekeeper, I think show us that these might be two proverbs that John brings together. Now what happens is that these two ideas are expanded in the following verses, in reverse order this time, And both of them are introduced by John's phrase, Amen, Amen, which in English we translate very truly. So in verse 7, we have the second section beginning that begins very truly, and it is the third of um, the I am sayings in John. And in verse 10, we get the fourth I am saying in John. But here it's I am the gate. These I am sayings in John are probably important faith statements of the Johannine community. Interestingly, they are also the statements that derive from the properties that wisdom says of herself in the wisdom literature. In our passage, the gate offers entry for protection and salvation and going out to find pasture. It concludes cryptically, claiming that thieves come to steal, to kill, and destroy, but Jesus comes so that the sheep may have life and have it abundantly. It is difficult to know who the thieves are in this passage if we try to allegorize it, if we try to look at what's happening in the passages around it. Who is Jesus pointing to as thieves? And in the past, we've tried to do that. But if we recognize that these figures of speech are indeed proverbs or maxims, then maybe we don't have to look too far. Maybe we don't have to look at all. I want to suggest that part of 
these, the recognition of these thieves is more about Jesus than it is about anyone else who came before him or around him. As I mentioned earlier, at the end of chapter 9, we have this controversy surrounding Jesus. And I think in chapter 10, we get a bit of what we could call apologetic uh, from the Johannine community about Jesus and the community itself. Perhaps what I'm trying to suggest is that these charges of being thieves and bandits, of being strangers and being possessed by the by devil or spirits, perhaps these charges were ones that were levied at Jesus and his followers. These verses suggest, though, that Jesus did not act like a thief or a stranger or one possessed. He did not come to destroy or kill or even scatter. In fact, he had no ulterior motives except the welfare of those with whom he came into contact. He came that others might have life. Now, this sounds familiar, in, even if we know just a little bit about John, doesn't it? Over the past few weeks, I've been reminding you about what John's purpose is in telling his gospel, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. Believing and knowing Jesus is also knowing who he is not. He isn't thief. He isn't possessed. He isn't a stranger. In Jesus' example and teachings are found life. Proverbially, we could say that in Jesus, one is led out into a safe place, or rather led into a safe place and led out to a fertile pasture. Actions are a powerful witness to identity in John. This is a theme that he'll come back to again and again. And in fact, at one point, Jesus says, if you don't believe what I'm saying, then look at what I'm doing. Actions are a powerful witness to identity. Here at the table this morning, we celebrate both the actions and identity of the one who John tells us was both the gate and the shepherd. Amen. Please join us in the singing of a hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord.
invite you to follow along with the great prayer of thanksgiving so you can follow along with the responses. Let us pray. God of life, through Jesus you showed us a new possibility, a life obedient to your will for humanity. You call and invite us to follow his example so that we might experience the fullness of life and also that others may see and experience the possibility of new life. We offer praise for the life of the Anointed One and thank you that Jesus did not die in vain. In a world full of privilege and power for the few, you call us to be a community of friends based on peace and love. In a world full of shattered dreams, we still find hope in you. In a world that rewards performance, you remind us of the joy of living. And in a world of anxiety, you call us to Sabbath. During this time of celebration, remind us of that change of mind, that repentance that leads to new life. In Jesus, you showed us the power of your love, a power which could not be silenced through execution and death. In Jesus, you were truly present in our world. In Jesus, you taught us the path of hospitality and the power of love. Through the Christ, you opened doors of possibilities that we may choose life over death, humanity over inhumanity, and friends over adversaries. Through these weeks after the resurrection, we hear of appearances and reminders of Jesus and his teaching to live a life centered on love. We celebrate Jesus' life and pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. Through this season, we are reminded how the disciples encountered the risen Christ in worship and hear how they experience the presence of Christ among them. We celebrate Jesus' life and pray to you. Hear, hear us, us, Lord of, of glory. glory. We are called to express and experience an unconditional selfless love. This love brings shalom, a peace which brings understanding. That shalom is found in the life we celebrate we pray to you, hear us, Lord of glory. Jesus is reputed to have been a great teacher and healer. We also recognize his sonship. We also have been promised a share in God's heritage. We celebrate Jesus' life and pray to you, hear us, Lord of glory. In God's love for the world, God showed us what was possible for humanity through Jesus. May we have the courage and strength to live as he was able. We celebrate Jesus' life and pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. 
You made a new humanity possible in Jesus, and he showed that what was possible to a small group of followers, they became the church, and the church has tried to live and hand down those possibilities to each new generation. In your mercy, give us the peace of mind to understand the kind of human beings we are called to be and strengthen us to live in that way so the world may also find that understanding. We celebrate Jesus' life and pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. In Jesus, you gave birth to a new way of being, to a new community. Through Jesus, you promised to send your spirit so that your presence would be with the church always. Help us to remember and not forget what we are called to do and who we are called to be. As we remember and celebrate the life and teaching of the, of the anointed in this wine and bread, help us to be the nourishment and sustenance to our friends in the faith so that discouragement is pl replaced with sustenance Hatred is replaced with love. Indifference is replaced with engagement. And suspicion is replaced with trust. May the peace of Christ be with you. Here the body of Christ is given so that we might find an alternative to a life of hatred and violence. Like bread, Jesus' teaching helps us discover the kind of human beings that God wants us to be. In Jesus' life, a new covenant between God and humanity was found. Here the grace of God is shown in common food. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery. As we participate in acts of compassion and remembrance, we make Jesus' presence real in our lives and in the lives of others. We remember how Jesus responded to the violence and hatred in the world with compassion and understand that we are invited to do the same in order to fulfill his commandment to love. And may we continue what he began. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the same spirit in which Jesus the Christ gave himself for us. Amen. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Please join in the singing of our last hymn. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Oh.